Thank you, Melissa, and good evening. I must say that one of the great pleasures of being a president of this institution is to be able to have President's Forum. And as the founder of President's Forum, Robert Otzum, former president of the Age Society and my husband, um, actually would say, you know, the only important thing about President's Forum is that the people have to be famous and they have to be interesting. And indeed, one of the things that we get to do is to have a conversation with interesting people, accomplished people, to try to go beyond the obvious, to probe further into what makes them who they are. And as Melissa said, that both Siddharth Mukherjee and Sarah Z completely qualify and more to be the President's Forum guests. How often is it that you can have an amazing visual artist who has had solo exhibitions in all major museums, including our own, we have a show right now, who has been given the MacArthur Genius Grant, I know we're not supposed to say that, but we know it is, um, and who is now just selected to represent the United States at the next Venice Biennale. And to have a noted oncologist, a researcher, a Rhodes Scholar, a recipient of the Pulitzer Prize and the Guardian Book Prize for his amazing book, The Emperor of All Melodies, a biography of cancer, and a hero to many cancer survivors, patients, and their families, Siddharth Mukherjee. For Asia Society, it's also important because it so happens that Sarah is Chinese-American, and Siddhartha is Indian, born in India, Indian American. They both transcend cultures, but are also interested in cultures. So it just goes to say that we had no choice. We had to have them. But more importantly, I think it is important to recognize that both of them could actually be individual guests for this program. And I must say, as I was preparing for this, I thought, gosh, I should have done that. Having a conversation together with two very interesting, powerful people, artists, scientists, writer, it's complicated. And I realize that some of you are here because you're fans of Siddharth. And some of you are here because you love Sarah's work. So I apologize to all of you that you will not be able to hear individually everything these two could talk about. But we decided that actually the purpose of this conversation is exactly what they've never done before, to have a joint conversation. So some of you will be disappointed, but we also agreed that in fact, to make this work, we also will have those of you who have read Siddhartha's book, but may not Sarah's work, to actually give you some taste of her work, and vice versa. So, this is really a journey, a conversation that, in fact, they've never done publicly. I'm sure that they do it over breakfast and dinners all the time. Um, and to really go on a journey where we learn about creative processes, we learn about cross-cultural connections, and we also learn about how we might think about arts and sciences together. So I feel extremely privileged to actually begin to have this conversation with Siddhartha Mukherjee and Sarah Z. Please join me in welcoming Sarah Z and Siddhartha Mukherjee. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, you've been friends for the institution for a while, Sarah, especially you, since we worked with you in 2001. And Siddharth is almost like a family now, since he's been coming for a number of our shows and other things as well. Let me really start with um, the very obvious question. And that is, Siddhartha, you come from the world of science, but the way you write is almost having a sense of poetry and intuitiveness that come through your book. Sarah, you come from the world of arts, but as Arthur Danto has said, that your work is almost like science projects, that there is a kind of precision about that that's quite different. Both of you, I was very struck reading Siddhartha's book and your work, that 
you both seem to move in and out of going to the ultimate minute micro things and move it back into macro. That you seem to be looking at details and moving away from it and back and forth. Sid, would you talk a little bit about that in your work and how that plays out for you? And I know that you wanted to also do some reading. Um, so uh, first of all, thank you for having Sarah and me uh, to this forum. Uh, we will, I promise we will not balance our checkbook or, or, <laughs> or do our bills. <laughs> Since I'm not feeding you yet either, <laughs> exactly. so. Right, so, you know, as, as, a, as a writer or as a scientist, of course, the question of scale is a, is a crucial question in, in, in my work. Um, there is a, of course, the famous quote that God is in the detail. In fact, th that's almost correct. In fact, God is in the scale. Um, and, and, and the correct scale is always uh, something that I think all writers, artists, scientists are constantly working with. Uh, and there is no correct scale, except scale all, always is, is, is in service of an answer or in service of a question. So the question demands the scale. And when you answer the question, you're, you're, answering, you're putting the scale in congruence to the question. There is no absolute scale. And this is true for, for all our work, actually. Um, and so it's one thing that I actually find particularly interesting that I, that I explore all the time in, in my work. Um, I was recently, I wrote a piece for um, the, the Times, uh, the New York Times Magazine, in which the question of scale was of particular importance. I'm just going to read a little section of it, which I think is, is interesting to me. So here, I was asked to write a piece from, uh, about memory. Um, and the question was... Why did he ask you to write about memory? You know, that's an interesting question. <laughs> I, I think that the, there was something in, in when the editors were reading uh, Emperor of All Maladies, they began to be interested in the question of where, do the, the, where, where does memory play a role in, in this particular book? Um, how does one remember the past in order to understand the future? Um, and, and, and one of the things that, that, that um, Elena Silverman, who was one of my editors at the New York Times Magazine, was very interested in is, again, what are the most personal elements of, of memory? And how do they relate to uh, uh, today? How do they relate to contemporary conversation today? So, so I, I, I was actually, I, I, I sometimes say that you often know the mood of a piece of writing before you know the piece of writing uh, itself. And, and this one, I, I have like a very clear vision of what happened. I was falling asleep one night, and I was thinking about this piece that I was writing, and I thought, um, and I suddenly had the vision, which then becomes this piece. And so I'm just going to read just two little paragraphs from it. Um, and so, so this, is a, this is a piece called The Letting Go. Now, interestingly, this piece was titled by uh, the magazine. I didn't title it. And I looked back at it, um, and it turns out The Letting Go is the name of a piece of Sarah Z's sculpture. <laughs> <laughs> Did they know that? No one knew this. It's from an Emily Dickinson poem. Right, exactly. Yes. But it was I remember that. The yeah. title of, I think, the work I was making when I met you yes. in Boston. And I didn't title this piece, actually. I mean, I, you know, I almost said... It's called Serendipity. <laughs> it's, it's, it's called true. Someone Else. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, so, so this is about um, a moment in, 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 my, in my life in, in Benares, a city that's actually very evocative to me. It had rained heavily the night before. The steep stone steps of the ghat, that's the part that goes into the river, are slick and slippery. And when my father pulls me onto the boat, the water feels more stable than the ground. The boatman rows out towards the open river, and the city of Varanasi swings into full view. On the bank, wrestlers are performing calisthenics. A vendor is selling marigolds. A man is throwing birdseed at pigeons. The river moves sluggishly at first, but then a cur current forces the boat around the bend, and we're floating silently by the Manikarnika Ghat, where the dead are burnt. And there, it already we've shifted the entire, it's as if the, the piece of writing, for me at least, has moved on a pivot. You start off with a memory that's very small, and now you're confronting the, actually the, in, in Benares, miles of burning bodies on a ghat. Um, I'm eight or nine years old, save a distant uncle who's died of renal failure with a catheter poking out of his pants. I've had no personal experience of death. I imagine it as little more than a corporeal exit from the world. And now it's an unforgettable sight, row upon row of burning bodies on the wooden pyre by the river's edge. There are dozens of pyres lighted at the ghat like lanterns along the river. 
along them, around them, as the circus of death unfolds, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, and here, here, here's what here's another switch that happens, and this goes on in the piece. Decades later, having trained as an oncologist in Boston, I attend the funeral service of a woman who has died after a long battle with cancer. I remember approaching the coffin and then registering something odd. The woman has been dressed up. There's a faintest blush of something lipstick on her mouth. And then I go on. At medical rounds a few days later, I ask some residents and interns about death. How many have carried the body of a parent? What does that weight feel like? And what about the ritual of bathing and cleansing the dead? So uh, again, this piece is, it, it brings back to me some, some of this idea of scale shift, because you move from, in time, across a child who's eight or nine years old, who all of a sudden rounds the bend of a river, but the bend of the river actually carries the shift in scale. Um, and then you move around the bend of time, which is the bend of about 30, 35 years. And that also carries a peculiar shift in scale, because we're not talking about one death or the burning of the body. We're talking about the carriage of a parent's body, because I have also now grown to 35 or 37. So uh, that's one illustration. But, and I thought it was very interesting. I thought I picked up this piece. I thought it was interesting. Again, right from the title, it's as if someone was watching and making a connection between my work and Sarah's work. <laughs> it's something that comes through in your book profoundly as you're going into a narrative of a story, come back again, give us a broader history of cancer, then come back to a story. And I think, Sarah, in your work, there is that notion of the mundane and the minute, and then open it up again. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, um, I brought, also brought some of my work upstairs, but also in slides um, to show, I, to just talk about some of these ideas that we came up with that really cross, I think, between our creative processes in a really fundamental way. So this, I mean, this idea of scale, scale shift has really always been central to my work, not only, oops, just, am I having a technical moment? Somebody has, is there a phone somewhere? Mm -hmm. Ah. <laughs> ah. But it's off. So, so just put it away. <laughs> the shift in scale. <laughs> the shift in scale. <laughs> <laughs> that moment. So um, this is actually a piece that I did. Vishaka curated me here in, when the building reopened in 2001. One. And um, she asked me if I wanted to do a, a piece for the reopening. And um, it was the, the third floor was going to have uh, masterpieces from the Rockefeller collection of Asian art. And I was really interested in this idea of this juxtaposition with a piece that where you had these uh, these absolute monuments, you know, these verified masterpieces. And what what could you put in terms of contemporary art next to this? And how could you shift that scale? So I made a piece that was actually I chose the location of doing a piece by the freight elevator on the third floor, um, so that it was really this unused space that you didn't expect to see artwork. And I was interested in this idea of actually how you see an artwork. What's your first impression and how it's presented to you? How what is the actual experience? of seeing, and I wanted to make a work that wasn't on a pedestal, that you didn't expect to see, that wasn't framed and that wasn't telling you I am a masterpiece, but that, that you discovered and had the sense of, does anyone else know this is here? And that you're seeing it, you sort of actually make, you know, questioning this idea of, is this a work of art? You bend so, the river. <laughs> yes, exactly. So literally, literally. And come upon it. Exactly. Yeah. So you yeah. sort of you actually you, you either come upon it coming or you actually were as you e as you exited the Rockefeller collection, it was framed in the window far away and you opened out onto this. Um, I wanted to, to, to play with this idea of um, of it almost looking like the, the the wall itself had peeled the paint away. So the piece is made out of peeling paint from the wall. So to play with this idea of an organic process that was somewhere between growing and decaying, that was caught in this, this shift, if you will, of scale. And as you move closer, the piece has, has, you know, becomes at once smaller and more intimate, but also implies this kind of landscape that is extremely expansive. Also this idea of it almost looking like a construction site, of some very mundane happening, so, you know, a, a leak in a wall, and how this could be transformed into something that fell between the mundane and the profound. So just quickly go through. Um, this was a this is a much more sort of to me obvious in a very concrete way. I mean, obviously I'm dealing with physicality, so the idea of scale actually represents itself in a very physical way. So you know, I've uh, been lucky to have a lot of opportunities to deal with very large spaces, 
This is the um, entranceway to SF MoMA, and I did a piece where I cut up a car into five pieces, and I wanted you to first come in and actually not recognize what this object was, even though it was something that we're very familiar with, and we know the scale of a car in relationship to the scale of our body. The whole design is about the scale of your body, but to totally throw that off and make it an, a sort of an abstract spill of objects. But as you got off the elevator on the top, you, you started to recognize what, what this object was, and you, you, uh, as you turned around it, you actually learned more about what this object had become. And then you, know, you saw parts like this from other parts of the building. The building has this oculus, which allowed you to see scale from many directions. And then when you got up close, again, you had this very, very intimate shift in scale, where you were almost inside the piece. Um, and the last, for, for each of the themes, I, sort of, I chose three pieces just to talk about. Um, these, these drawings are actually upstairs. Um, and it's sort of interesting to talk about these drawings in relation to what Siddharth read. Um, and it's interesting what you read, because I've read it many times, but I didn't think of this, which you probably obviously thought of, but this very, very sort of um, mundane, simple idea, physical idea of weight. That the, that the, the story that, or the, the piece right. starts with the weight of the body right. transitioning from, you obviously know, I didn't, I didn't get this, but <laughs> transitioning from the step into the water and the physical weight of your body in the boat and it ends with this question of what, is it, what does it mean to carry the weight of a dead body? Right. So and yet as the weight of the body, actually life is lost out of it. Absolutely. Yeah, it's yeah. yeah. really very fascinating. beautiful. Yeah. Um, so this is, a, this is a, um, a series of works that I did that were portraits. And I was asked to give a donation to a benefit and I didn't have actually any, any physical work to give at the moment and I said, well, I'll do a portrait. I'll propose this idea. People will buy a portrait. And what they will give me is they'll give me 12, sem what they describe as 12 seminal events in their life. Um, and they'll give this to me on a list, like a letter in an envelope. And um, they'll give it to me. I'll open it. I'll read it. I will draw these events in no, in, in no particular order, tumbling from one to the next. And this idea of the scale shifts of something and everyone gave me a, an event, like obvious events like the death of a parent, the birth of a child, but almost everyone had one or two that were, you know, picking mushrooms with their brother, you know, um, losing, uh, losing um, their, you know, their, um, their first, you know, their first letter from a, uh, from a, um, a lover, like, you know, when in a, you know, through the crack in a floor. These sort of very, very small moments. Um, and I wanted to have this thing where you had these kind of really the way that we me remember our lives and value our lives where things tumbled from one to the next. Um, and they also, for me, it was this idea of a portrait of how do you, uh, you know, fundamentally what a portrait is about is how you bring out the interior, the fundamental interior of another person. It's not about the exterior, it's about the inner emotion. And that also a portrait is really a conversation or a relationship between two individuals, the artist and the subject, and that this was actually a result and an intimate, an intimate experience. Mm -hmm. But it's like writing, it was writing to me in this idea of how a portrait could also be like a letter. Well, sometimes your work has that notion of writing, yes. and then it moves to yes. something else, yes. and there's a surprise. A narrative, uh, narrative reason, too, exactly. this idea of, an, of how you move through space and right. time, there's an int introduction moment and as you move then, through space, it's almost right. like the second chapter, the third chapter. Right. And then actually, you've written a bit about this idea in an interview, I remember, that you were talking about that notion of an aha moment, where mm. the thing goes outside of yourself mm. and something happens. Mm. And you say, it's almost like it's happening by itself. Mm. And that idea of creativity or accident or the things that move from one to the other. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that's a pretty important part of your work. Mm. And before I ask you to show some more work, I wanted to actually ask you, Siddharth, and that is that I realized that somehow you had figured out that there was a connection between you and Sarah, even before you met Sarah, mm -hmm. just from looking at her work. <laughs> Tell us what it was that made you obsess with this artist before you met her? Um, I knew Sarah's work before I knew Sarah, um, which is why I made it a point to know Sarah. Uh, <laughs> and the rest and is history, as they say, right? Exactly. <laughs> um, I had seen her work. I'd seen, first I'd seen pictures of her work, um, and then I went to the Whitney, 
um, to see, I don't know if you have a picture, do you have a picture biennial, of I the biennial know. piece? No. Anyway, um, I went to see the Whitney piece, this was uh, in 2000. 2000. Uh, yeah, 2000. 2000, yep. yes. 2000. Um, I was then a medical student in, in, in Boston. I'd come up to New York, and I, I uh, have always adored the contemporary arts, and so I went to the Whitney to see the biennial, and I walked in to see Sarah's sculpture. It's a little bit hard to describe the experience. Uh, one word would be enveloping. Um, the other word would be cosmic. There's a cosmic quality about right. it, uh, that you, you enter the piece and you can't leave it. It's like being inside uh, a trap. Um, and um, and you can, <laughs> but it's cosmic nonetheless, That's right? Cosmic so nonetheless, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, a cosmic trap, right? Uh, and and you can't leave it. You can't. You cannot take. Um, I, you cannot take your eyes off the piece. Um, we we sometimes actually we, we had this conversation once about the about going to India and seeing the Taj Mahal, right? The Taj Mahal is the one of the, the, the the world's great beautiful cliche, um, and yet when you actually experience it in person, and many people here have. It, the experience is that you cannot take your eyes off it. It is that, it is so mesmerizing as a, a sculpture that you just cannot take your eyes off it. And if you do, and if you take your eyes off, this is an interesting experience, you should be, it's almost an experiment. You turn your eyes away from it and you see it again, and it is as if it has come to you and you're a baby and you're seeing it anew. Mm -hmm. And you can do this 10 times and it will still appear new to you. Um, so there's this, you know, there was that kind of quality that was so mesmerizing in Sarah's work. But one of the things that to me was very interesting, and, and, and I want to come back to this uh, idea, is that not only was, was all of this kind of this in the abstract sense uh, cosmic, but I was very interested in the emotional scale of Sarah's work, mm -hmm. in, the emotional, in the emotional quantities in Sarah's work, in the emotional depth, uh, in grief. Um, and actually the titles in Sarah's work often give away that grief. You, don't, you, you, you often sense the work in the, in the abstract, you, you often sense the work, you might begin to sense the work in wonder, but when you sense the work the second time around, when you turn your eyes away and look at it again, there is grief, uh, for me. Um, so, uh, Sarah, do you mind showing the picture of the, of the, of the, the car that you just, yeah. just um, and, and, and tell us about the woman who uh, talked, to her, talked to you about the accident. Oh, that's interesting. I forgot about it. I didn't even know you knew that story. Um, <laughs> See, that's why we have this conversation. <laughs> yeah. Um, when I when I did this piece, um, obviously it was a you know it was it took a lot of uh, preparation before I, beforehand and talks, and I think it was the d director of development at the museum came up to me. This is the type of story I never tell about my work, but um, you know came up to me in tears and she said that. Um, she had lost, uh, I think, her child in a, in, a, car in a car accident. And that she was very against and upset about the idea that this would be in the space. Um, but that uh, it was actually her, the, the, her favorite thing that had ever happened there. And that it was transformative for her. Um, and that, it, that she realized that it had nothing to do with that in, 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 its, um, in the flat sense of, of that but in much more, you know, that it was much more complex and layered and for her a very liberating experience to see. So it was nice. It was interesting yeah. that you should pick up that idea of emotions because most people who write about your work don't usually write yeah. about the emotional yeah. side. And yet almost all of us have that experience. To experience your work is almost nonverbal. There is something that happens. And yet, it is interesting that most people don't write about it. You know, I think the emo em emotion in relationship to visual art has been—it's—it's it's deep privilege, the, the lang yeah. the, and the language around it is pretty. Yes. It, you know, it's mostly—it's art articulated. You know, it's articulated through the formal and the cerebral right. usually. Right. I mean, people accept, for example, that emotion with music is going to be yeah. probably your you know, your central entrance, yeah. um, but they don't accept that in the same At way. At least now, in the visual arts. It didn't used to be like that. Yeah. I mean, obviously, in the Renaissance and other yeah, places, yeah, they yeah. Know people have that emotive content. So for you to pick that up is sort of interesting. Uh, well, whenever I, I mean, as a, this is true in general, when I, when I read something, when I see a piece of work, when I see Sarah's work, um, I usually enter it through two kinds of approaches. And we talked a little bit about this before. And one is, one approach is, what is the question that the work is asking? 
um, to me. Um, it's very much the way you started your book. Yes, yeah, what is the question? What is the question? Um, I, I, I mean, it's fundamentally what a, a scientific way of approaching right. creativity, right? That a, a laboratory always starts with a question. Yes, it is, and, and, and whenever you have a conversation with, with people who are in the sciences, who are really in the sciences, the conversation is always, always begins, if it's not stated, it's certainly in, in, in the larger realm. And the larger realm is, what is the question you're asking? And, and why, why are you asking the question? Um, and then the second piece is, what is the, what is the question? And what is, it, what is its emotional content? Why, why, what is it, what is question, what, why does this question mean something? Why does this question mean something to you? Why does this question mean something to me? If, I feel as if, if a book or a work of art even answers one of these two questions, um, it for me is incredibly successful. Um, if, it, if, it can, if it can answer both, which Sarah's work typically does, uh, then, you know, then you get a, right. you get a double You've run. got a fan here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking of that idea of creativity and what is the question, uh, one of the things that I thought was very interesting is that both of you had that idea of creativity and the experience, and it's almost like an out-of-body experience. You've written about it by saying that there comes a moment where it's almost like you've started the work and the work takes off, mm. and you're almost surprised by mm. it. And you've written, Sid, also about that idea that in the scientific world, most of the time it's being thought of it as iterative process, lots of details, details leading on to one another. And there comes a moment, there's this powerful notion and a theory where the puzzle almost as if you're watching the puzzle solving itself. That's almost like an out-of-body experience, that notion of the aha moment. Mm. Describe a little bit for us, mm -hmm. what is that process for mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. in terms of that mm -hmm. you know, movement that goes ahead of itself? Yeah, I mean, I think there are, two, there are two interesting ways in my mind to talk about that uh, in relation to my work. I mean, I think, I think, um, I think that at, there's a certain point for me when I'm making a work, and getting to that point is always, uh, you know, a lot. I was thinking about our discussions. You know, Siddharth does come to my studio all the time. I read his work and edit his, and write his writing all the time. Sometimes, um, sometimes well, past midnight. <laughs> like last night, like I was reading night. his and work. And do you listen to her? I listen. I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very good listener. He's, um, yeah. And do you I mean, listen to him? Yes. yes. Oh. I mean, not always. That's not true. You don't always <laughs> listen to me. That's not true. But I would say that one of the things that I think is really fascinating in, in, in working with him creatively on his own work is he does, he's an incredibly quick editor. He changes things so quick. I mean, I'll say, I think that, and he'll go, doop, and he'll just erase it. Or he'll, I mean, he moves everything around at this amazing speed, and there's this incredi incredible willingness to recreate the work in the moment. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things that I found um, fascinating and um, amazingly creatively brave about the book is that if you read the first chapter of this book, I think every single page is different. I mean, the first, sorry, the first um, draft. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember when, he, when his book came out and we had a, a little party, I said, I said that, that it was amazing how he changed the willingness the, to change, which I think is so crucial um, in, in making a successful work of art. Is um, was was amazing that the book had totally changed. And his editor gave us a talk afterwards and said, "Well, if he changed every page, he knew he knew what he was doing the whole time." And <laughs> just this idea, well, the, but also this idea that you need to know what you're doing right. is actually, I think, overrated in some ways. <laughs> that you know yeah. that of course he knew what he was doing, but but actually, there's a you think if the creative process takes its full force, that you, as, as the maker, there is this uh, humble side to it, where you know that, as you were talking about, there's a mo for me, there's a moment where the work start. you're having a conversation with the work, getting it to that point where... And the work talks back to you, right? And the work talks back yeah. to you. And the work, I think, what it, for me, the most interesting thing in my work is always what I least expected to have happen, and I recognize as being interesting, and then keep or frame in a certain way. And I, I, I think one of the things that's incredible about visual art and seeing visual art is that, and I think it's true in writing, absolutely, is when you're reading or you're looking at it, that moment of the unexpected in the work is actually translated to the viewer and translated to the reader. Yes. 
Absolutely. And you know as you're reading it that this could not have been planned, yeah, yeah. that it happened in the moment. And <laughs> do you want me to talk a little about yes, this idea? Yes, absolutely. I mean, in the second, I mean yes. the second part of this is that I think um, something that's interesting. Uh, plug in or find it Uh oh. <laughs> Did we plug um, in or find another <laughs> power source? Um, the, the second thing. Um, that I was going to talk about in relation to, to this idea is I think that um, both of us are in our work, um, and I'll talk about me in particular, I'm interested in this idea of, of the work being actually about experimentation, that a work actually manifests a, a quality of experimentation, so that when you experience it, you have the sense that it's that it, and this has to do with shifting scale. It's not just a scale, but this mo of, of the, the experience of the work of actually being caught in a moment where something is perhaps growing or dying, succeeding or failing, um, you know, moving or or standing still. Um, so this is actually I put this up. This is a piece I did in the Venice Biennale. I just put it up because I um, now I'm doing it again, and this is uh, in 1998, and. Um, it, it, um, it was in the bigger show. It, yes, yeah. it was in the yes. Now I'm doing the, the pavilion, right. but it was in the group right. show. Right. And um, the idea, of, you know, f the idea that I was thinking of was this idea that um, I would put up lights first, and that the work would speed. To, that work was almost had this idea of a life force, like it was a lie. I mean, it's a very old idea in sculpture. How do you breathe life into an inanimate object? And I'm interested and always been interested in this idea of how how an experience becomes valuable and how an object becomes valuable. And to make a, an actual artwork where it felt like it had a, it was a, it had a life source or felt like it behaved with some kind of need for sustenance. So the idea was that the piece would accumulate around light and then would speed to sort of survive and, 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 and get to another point and accumulate. It was obviously maps things like the way urban environments grow, like viruses grow. But, the, but then the other idea in this piece it, it was that it went out this window, which I discovered and opened, much like opening well, the window there. It's like what happens right. And there was an arm that went in, into the Did water. And this someone I said that Sarah never met a wall that she didn't want to break. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it had an arm <laughs> that went out into the water, and it, it bounced on the water, and it tapped back on the window. So this, this idea that it almost felt like the piece itself was an experiment. Uh, this is a really fundamental idea in this piece that I did at the High Line, where it um, it's called you know uh, it's called a model for a habitat, and I was interested in this idea of a, some of, of like a scientific model or some are you modeling behavior? Are you modeling the way something might become? Um, and I wanted to make a piece, um, but it was really an experiment. Uh, the High Line, I think, is an incredibly successful experiment in urban space, period. And it was really this question of, ha of what could you add to it? Does it need artwork? It is a really successful, in my mind, kind of artwork in itself. Um, and so the challenge of not making something that was really just like plop art and uh, that you don't really need there because it's mm -hmm. such an incredible experience. Um, so I thought, you know, the one thing that it's framed this incredible um, natural environment that even used to exist there. But the one thing that it hasn't framed is the fact that there are these, this, there is actually this very vibrant wildlife of birds, bees, butterflies that that survive everywhere in our city, and particularly this is like a locus for that. So to make a, so almost a sculpture that framed their existence. Um, so I, I made this. Th this it's making you see something that you otherwise that might not see. That's and that, the point. Well, also, that's everywhere right. around you. Right. I mean, one of the funny things is that this apparently is the most photographed place in the High Line is right. mostly people photographing a bird when they see it. How many times <laughs> do you see a bird in New York? All the time. But all of a sudden, it's, there's a bird. Let's get a picture with it. So this idea of drawing your att attention to their presence right. um, was, was really the idea. And obviously, scale shifts. I mean, this piece is very related to the work upstairs in terms of perspective, in terms of having you go to a minute bir piece of bird seed to the point at the tip of the Empire State mm -hmm. Building, for example. Um, and the last point that I think is interesting to me about experiment was I wanted people to engage, that it should always be, like the experience had to be an, a, you know, an engagement with that experience in space. 
So the final kind of solution when I kept thinking like this is this is going to like this is set for failure to do a sculpture on the High Line because we can't compete with the location. So the the final thing that I think was like sort of an aha moment in terms of conceptualizing it was okay, I'm gonna, it's a promenade and one of the great things again is what they didn't do. They did nothing. You walk there. That's all you do. You have no choices. You can only walk. So to make the promenade actually uh, bisect the piece itself so that you uh, you see it, you enter it, you leave it. Um, and that the piece grows from north to south on one side and south to north on the other. Yeah. I mean, it seems to me that in a way what you're talking about is that you had a broad concept. Yeah. You were thinking about the location. Yeah. And then in the place, things happen. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which is, most people often think of your work as like you're bringing gazillion things, yeah. you've figured it out, yeah. and then you're going to put it in there. Yeah. So that you are prepared, in that sense, it's very zen-like. Mm. That you have complete practice, mm. you have thought it, and then you let yourself go. Sure, I mean, it's always a balance, right? right? It's a balance yeah. of that sort and of... And that you want the viewer to also participate in that notion of surprise, and yeah, almost a feeling that something has happened. When mm. you were writing the book, did you have those moments as well? I mean, it seems I felt it when I was reading it. I mean, you know, it, it, one interesting feature of, 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 of writing this book is that one interesting feature of experiments is that you have to let experiments go wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't let experiments go wrong, you have to be ham-fisted sometimes. Um, there's, a, there's a very famous quote by um, Wolfgang Pauli, who's a famous physicist, uh, one of my favorite quotes by him. Um, Wolfgang Pauli was very eccentric, and um, he um, was once brought a thesis of a young student to judge. And he looked at the thesis and he said, it's so bad that it's not even wrong. Um, <laughs> um, so I thought that I would invert Wolfgang Pauli's principle and write, sometimes write things that were so wrong that they couldn't be bad. Um, so, so in other words, you have to let yourself do very wrong things. And, and, and then in that vulnerability, you discover something important about yourself. So he, I'm going to read a passage. Actually, I hadn't marked this passage. This is marked as I was talking to you upstairs. I hadn't marked <laughs> this passage. But, um, but here's a passage which has no place, as far as I can see, has really no place in a book on cancer. But every time I took it out, it felt as if there was, a, there was an itch for this passage. Um, now, you wouldn't know this, but I, I tried to take it out many, many times. Mm -hmm. And every time I would come back and say, you know, that's, it, it, it's just missing. It has to go back in there. So it's a passage that starts uh, about a time when I'm beginning to, to take care of patients, mature as a, as a fellow. Um, and it begins with Primo Levi, one of my favorite authors. The Italian memoirist Primo Levi, who survived a concentration camp and then navigated his way through a blasted Germany to his native Turin, often remarked that among the most fatal qualities of the camp was its ability to erase the idea of a life outside and beyond itself. A person's past and present were annihilated as a matter of course. To be in the camps was to abnegate history, identity, and personality, <coughs> but it was the erasure of the future that was the most chilling. With that annihilation, Levi wrote, came a moral and spiritual death that perpetuated the status quo of imprisonment. If no life exists beyond the camp, then the distorted logic by which the camp operates becomes life as usual. Now, cancer is not a concentration camp, but it shares the quality of annihilation. It negates the possibility of life outside and beyond itself. It subsumes all living. The daily life of a patient becomes so intensely preoccupied with his or her illness that the world outside fades away. How to overcome him became my obsession, the journalist and poet Max Lerner wrote about the lymphoma in his spleen. If it was going to be a combat, then I had to engage it with everything I had, knowledge and guile, ways covert as well as overt. And then, this is the passage that's particularly weird. It gets weirder and weirder uh, in a book on cancer. I was not immune to this compulsive preoccupation either. In the summer of 2005, as my fellowship hurtled to its end, I experienced perhaps the singularly transforming event in my life, the birth of my daughter. Glowing, beautiful, and cherubic, Leela was born on a warm night at Massachusetts General Hospital, then swaddled in blankets and brought to the newborn unit on the 14th floor. The unit is directly across from the cancer ward. The opposition of the two is hardly a coincidence. As a medical procedure, childbirth is least likely to involve infectious complications and thus the safest neighbor to a ward where any infection can turn into a lethal rampage. As in so much in medicine, the juxtaposition between the two wards is purely functional and yet just as purely profound. I would like to see this moment, I would like to see myself at my wife's side, 
awaiting the miraculous moment of my daughter's birth as most fathers do. But in truth, I was gowned and gloved like a surgeon with a blue sterile sheet spread out in front of me and a long syringe in my hands, poised to harvest the maroon gush of blood from the umbilical cord. When I cut that cord, part of me was the father, but the other part was an oncologist. Umbilical cord blood contains one of the richest known sources of blood-forming stem cells, cells that can be stored away in cryobanks and used for bone marrow transplantation to treat leukemia in the future, an intensely precious resource which is often flushed down the sink in hospitals. The midwives rolled their eyes. The obstetrician, an old friend, asked jokingly if I ever stopped thinking about my work. But I was too far steeped in the study of blood to ignore my instincts. In the transplant rooms across that very hallway were patients for whom I had scoured tissue banks across the nation for one or two pints of these same stem cells. Even in this life-affirming of all moments, the shadow of malignancy and death were forever lurking on my psyche. So, again, you know, why, why, why are you writing a history of cancer in which you all of a sudden decide to insert the birth of your child? I don't know, but <laughs> it had to be there, and there was no way I showed it to Nan Graham, my editor, and she said, if you feel it's right, leave it in, and it, it's in. And that is quoted more often yeah, that, that, than that many is of more. your other passages, yeah, right. yeah. for sure. But it seems to me that partly what you're doing there is that notion of emotion and cerebral. And it's yeah. something that both of you seem to really play with a lot mm -hmm. and in terms of whether it's kind of going in and then coming out mm -hmm. at a different place and mm -hmm. not always knowing where that's going to come out. I was mm -hmm. going to ask you why you felt that that Primo Levi quote or the passage, you really wanted to take it out. Well, I, partly because... Because it's so profound the way you make that connection, actually. Yeah, partly because I was, I'm, I'm so afraid of Primo Levi because he is such an amazing writer. Uh, it's like, uh, it's, like if, it's as if Sarah put a little piece of, uh, you know, a piece of uh, the edge of the face of the Mona Lisa in her, <laughs> in her sculpture. It, 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 it's, it's fearsome. What's interesting about Primo Levi, of course, is that if he, whenever he was asked, are you a writer, he would say, no, actually, I'm a chemist. Mm. Um, and, and how do you answer that question? I say, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but he always used to say, I'm a chemist. Um, and so that's the problem. The problem is that you have this figure. Um, and I had admired, you, you know, Survival in Auschwitz, I think, is, is a, a book to end all books. Um, uh, I keep re reading it over and over again for farming. What's interesting about it is, as a book to me, as a writer to me, as to experience that book, is to remember that there is no moment in the book where emotion comes blasting out of the pages. It is a cold book. The tone of the book is cool. And yet, in that cool tone is conveyed the central monstrosity of the 20th century. How do you do that? How do you manage without once without once raising the tone of the book to convey the, the incredible quality. I mean, it, that's why I'm saying anyway, I was afraid of Primo. I, st I still am. Uh, <laughs> but, but not but so had, afraid. But not afraid. Yeah. Who was afraid of, right. who's afraid of Primo Levi? Uh, <laughs> not me. So speaking of reading, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to imagine. Here you are, an oncologist. You're in the cancer patients. You're writing 15 minutes a day. And you're reading all this stuff. Are you a big reader too? And do you guys share what you're reading and, and affect each other that way? Yeah, I mean, he gets books sent to him now so much. He, he, he I mean, he reads, uh, he eats books um, every <laughs> night. So, you know, but I get, I, I get the, them afterwards. And when he was writing that book, I have to say that I read it about 10 times, so I didn't have that as much time to read <laughs> But You're I, too busy but reading that yeah. and doing your work, right? But mm -hmm. I mean, we, I read, a, a, you know, I would say 20% of what I read is actually just what I come from my own. He doesn't read at all, but I would say 80% is, I mean, that's the great thing about writing a book is actually we have books in all over the house that are sent to us and books that he's researching and you can pick one up. There's five in the bathroom and another. <laughs> so, yes, but uh, he's, he has a, he, has an ability to read, and he read Harry Potter in one night. <laughs> <laughs> Obsessively. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so no. it's, a di it's certainly. And a do you also level. then suggest things that you're looking at that you like that then you will say, Siddharth, let's go see that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think probably, you know, 90% of what he sees visually is, is from me. 
but like for example, the Primo Levi book is bi actually is was both of our one of both of our very very favorite books before mm. we knew each other. Um, George Orwell is one of our both of our favorite writers before we knew each other. Ajanta and Alora is a place where both of us were obsessed with and in India. So you gonna go there? Yes. <laughs> Ajanta and Elora are these great monuments. Some of you know this, and Sarah is obsessed with them, and she hasn't been. Yep. So we gotta figure this out. Yes. Next time, not just to visit the family. Yes. As my husband would tell me, you know, let's do something beyond visiting family, you know. <laughs> this is important, actually. Um, let me just switch the subject slightly, since we are into Ajanta and Elora, mm -hmm. and the fact is that you're going to India a lot. Both of you obviously come from um, really erudite, educated, an Indian family in your case, and in your case, Chinese-American, mixed family. Often when people talk about distinguished people like yourselves, they don't want to talk about cultural imprint or if there is one. How do you think that the cultural upbringing for both of you has affected your work, your thinking, and how is it affecting you vis-a-vis um, -vis each other? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think <coughs> there are many, many ways to approach that question. And um, for me, I think the most interesting way to approach it is, is to think about complexity. I mean, the levels of complexity in that question uh, are so infinite. I mean, the idea of what a cultural identity, what is it, what is the, you know, what does it mean if we say, what does India mean to you? Like, everyone in this room is going to, so it's so hard to actually have that conversation without first starting with what culture, what that right. even means. Right. Um, and for me, I think it means about, it, it means a celebration of complexity, right. which is something that I'm interested in my wor work. That this It's a layering that keeps coming back. Absolutely. And that something, you know, you can't define things, I think, like that. The minute you define them, they've shifted to this, the, the slippery notion of that. Mm -hmm. Um, the idea of how it's more, for me, interesting to look at borders where things, you know, I mean, the sh for me, the show at Asia Society is all about this line between where a drawing becomes a sculpture and how something can sit between that and, and exist in both places at the same time and, uh, and also, even as you're watching it, flip between the two. So that things are, are, are again, they're live, they're shifting, they're fragile, defining them is almost impossible. So I think fundamentally, my, my um, my, the most interesting way for me to approach that question is to try and make it complex rather than and it's simple. also contextual. So at certain times, certain things come up. I mean, Absolutely. it seems to me that you might not have done this show with the idea of shifting perspectives and Chinese landscape, were it not the Asian Society. I mean, I think, for the, I think the idea for the Asian Society was to make a very precise show right. um, that had two things in mind. One, for me, was just about, was about drawing. But fundamentally, that drawing could be a way of seeing process. That drawing, in some ways, is this note taking. It's like, you know, wouldn't it be interesting to read the first notes that Siddharth wrote? Wouldn't it be amazing to see, you know, the, draw the, the first drawing that, you know, uh, Frank Gehry made for his Frank Gehry house? That, that, that a drawing can be sort of the skeleton and the, the, the as you know, this idea that what, where did, which the, where's the drop in right. that starts the entire process, the, the rings yeah. falling out. Yeah. And so that drawing could be that. Uh, I have two kinds of answers to the question. One is perverse and one is less perverse. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me give you the perverse answer first. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's an interesting answer. When you, Abraham Verghese, who right. you talked to we here. Have, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Abraham Verghese's first book, First book? Yes, it is. My book. Own Country. Yeah, it's called yes. My Own Country. Um, now, it's, it's a very subversive title mm -hmm. because Abraham Verghese comes, his family comes from India, mm -hmm. and then they lived in Africa for a long time. And then uh, Verghese got a job uh, working in Tennessee. Right. Um, it's in the south somewhere, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Tennessee. So he got, a, he, he got a job working in Tennessee, and then a very interesting thing happens. To and him. a physician also. He's a physician. Um, a very interesting thing happens to Verghese in Tennessee. He is sitting in rural Tennessee, being a doctor, and all of a sudden he starts noticing young men, typically men, coming in from New York um, with, with horrible infections and complications of infections. Um, and it's because what has happened is that AIDS has hit New York City. 
And uh, these young men ha are twice rejected. They're twice orphaned. They were essentially thrown out of their homes, um, typically because of being homosexual, in Tennessee. So they were orphaned then. They go to New York uh, and now come back to the home that they were thrown out of because no one else will take care of them. Um, and so they are now returning back to Tennessee. And so it's almost like an echo of the larger catastrophe that is happening in New York. And Verghese's, my own country, is Tennessee. And he says that, in fact, he discovers, he makes it by becoming the physician to these men. Um, he discovers his own country. His own country is not South India. His own country is not Africa. But it is, in fact, Tennessee. And to me, that's a very interesting idea, that your own country is the country of your elected affinity. Um, and therefore, it by its very nature transcends culture. There is, there is everything about India in this book, but there's nothing about India in this book. Um, and that is very important. Um, and therefore, it's your decision whether you want, how you want to read it. It's your decision how you want to read Verghese's book. Um, it, how you come to it is your own country. Um, and it is a, it's a very unique, uh, it's a very unique uh, decision. Sometimes when I'm feeling particularly perverse and someone says to me, are you Indian? I say, no, I'm actually from Lithuania. Uh, <laughs> I said, depends on the day. <laughs> exactly. So, so, so that's, that's, that's one answer. I mean, I, and I think that for me, my own country happens to be in this book, happens to be the cancer wards, mm. happens to be transnational, uh, happens to be uh, the fact that, that my culture uh, had enough inside it to be able to give me the freedom to, to transcend that culture. Um, that freedom is my cultural inheritance. That the freedom that I don't have to write about India is, my, is, is, a, is the greatest gift that India gave me. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's one answer. The, the second answer ha goes back a little bit, and we were talking about this earlier. Mm -hmm. There's, of course, a famous legend in, in Indian mythology of Abhimanyu. Mm -hmm. um, and the legend is, I mean, for people who don't know this, Abhimanyu was, is, is in his mother's womb. He's Krishna's son. And Krishna has given, is, it has talked so often about the battlefield of Kurukshetra. He's talked so often. And particularly, Krishna is interested, and there are many versions of the story. I'm telling one version. But particularly, Krishna is interested in a very, very lethal battle formation, uh, which is a trap to a soldier. That, so, that soldiers surround you. It's called a chakravihu. Um, mm -hmm. It plays a very large role. It's kind of a labyrinth of soldiers mm -hmm. in which the soldiers surround you and you cannot work your way out of that labyrinth. And Krishna has said this so many times to his wife. He described this labyrinth. He describes the strategy. And at one point of time, he makes a mistake. And as I said, there are many versions of the story. And Abhimanyu, who has heard this so many times, says from the womb, he says, that's a mistake. Um, right. You've made a mistake mm -hmm. to his father from the womb. He says, you've made a mistake. And in fact, the correct formation is this. And Krishna is so hurt and angry at Abhimanyu that he says, it will be your curse that when this moment happens to you as an adult, you will not be able to find your way out of the Chakravihu. And this is how Abhimanyu dies. He, he gets right. at the in moment. In the war. Yes. In the war. At the moment that he is stuck in the Chakravihu and the labyrinth of soldiers is all around him, he forgets the way out because he had, his father had cursed him and it's impossible. Now, the, this is the problem with being Bengali. <laughs> Uh, this is correct, because now we go to the next place, right? That's right, because there is Tagore, right? And as you're sitting in the womb <laughs> of being Bengali, you are being, Tagore is insinuating his way, as only Tagore can, but not only Tagore, Bengal has a much richer tradition of writing, but Tagore is insinuating his way into your blood and into your veins, and the question is, how do you as a writer get rid of him? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you... So I just want to point out that here you are talking about transcending cultures. And right there you're talking about being a Bengali. Yes. Well. So right there or a Lithuanian. An interesting contradiction <laughs> or Lithuanian. I mean, I often have said that for all many of us that I've said at least I have six identities. <laughs> Sometimes I'm an Indian who lives Fridays. in America. <laughs> Fridays. Sometimes I'm an American who happens to be from India. Right. Sometimes I'm just a Gujarati girl who is in New York. And each one of these are very real, yes. but they're just completely different. Yes. And I think to some extent what you're talking about, both of you, is that it's sort of the best of what art does, which is that it's both of a place and it has a capacity to transcend the place. And that those of us who are fortunate enough to have layered identities, we can constantly play that. 
everyone has low level off, fees. And, and we all have it, but in fact, sometimes it's much more so because, you know, I mean, you grew up in Delhi, you come from Bengal, you have a sense of a Bengali, which has always, I think, is very interesting that in India, no matter where you are, and your family has been five generations in South India, <coughs> but somebody says, who are you? said, I'm a Gujarati. <laughs> 500 years, what are you talking about? No, I'm a Gujarati, you know? So there right. is that idea of specificity, but also transcending it. Um, in terms of your kids, I mean, I, first of all, I have to say, you're reading, you're working, you both are in, you're in your studio. What do you do for fun with your kids? Do you have time? We have lots of time. Is that true? You have lots of time? I mean, we, I, we feel like we, you know, <laughs> do not. <laughs> no, I feel like it too, yeah. Uh, I feel like every, I mean, we, what do we do for it? We, every weekend, I mean, we, I, I love New York. We had, I go went back and forth between Boston um, when we, for a while, because he was in Cambridge. I mean, New York, what's not to do with your children? <laughs> Are you walk out, I mean, we live across the street from the Rubin Art Museum, and we're, you know, Helen Abbott is, yeah. who we worked with. You know, you can walk over there we, every last afternoon weekend we were at the, and look we, at... We were at the Islamic galleries at the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, yeah. you know, you, you don't, you didn't, you, your children don't need, you know, you don't need to do things with your children. The things in New York appear... You so your uh, fun things to do are going to museums and... Or reading. Or reading. Reading. Or reading. Ma making French fries. Did you read Harry Potter <laughs> to your girls? Not yet. I, I think uh, Leela would be scared to death of Harry Potter as I was when I was reading it. As <laughs> This is how it should be experienced. <laughs> she should be getting chills. And I think that she, if I read it to her, she would be getting chills too. So I, I'm just going to wait for her to experience them herself. I'm going to open it up to the audience, but I have one last question. And that is that here you both are prime of your career. You've finished an amazing book. You're going to, you know, last time when you worked on the book, you talked a lot about this idea of really just staying the course, answering the question. Mm -hmm. And you didn't have the entire baggage of Pulitzer Prize and The Guardian and everything else. Um, as and you now are going on and you will represent the United States and the Venice Biennale, do you feel the weight of the kind of accomplishment, and how do you do away, like you were saying in your book, keep undoing stuff to keep moving to the next level. So what's your next project? Um, <laughs> so no I, pressure. <laughs> um, I haven't announced my next project, actually, and I think my, my editors are somewhere here. My publishers <laughs> are somewhere here. So I'm, I'm, going to, uh, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about it, but I'm not, I'm, actually, I don't know the answer myself. Um, I was going to write a small book um, and it is small in size, um, but it's, I think it's not going to be, unfortunately, small in size. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the idea of inheritance um, and what inheritance does, how inheritance happens. And by inheritance, I don't just mean biological inheritance. I mean inheritance as an idea in human history. Um, and I'm interested particularly in the idea of the future of inheritance. Uh, what, if, what, what happens when we begin to manipulate inheritance? So uh, the genome. The genome. Mm. Um, and, and, and what happens when you manipulate inheritance so much so that you can have, uh, you are undoing one of the fundamental forces that has glued kinship together. Kinship is glued through inheritance. Uh, and what would the future begin to be like if that became unglued? Uh, can it ever become unglued? Um, and of course, the flip side of that question is what is then, if inheritance become unglued, what happens to our understanding of legacy and mortality. So uh, these are early days. Uh, I don't know uh, how these will coalesce into a book. Do you feel the pressure that it has to be as successful, or are you not worried about that? Uh, I think if you feel the, the minute that that pressure is poisonous uh, mm -hmm. to anything that's creative, um, I, I really think that you have to start from scratch. You have to be, you have to <coughs> not be an expert to write, to make artwork. I mean, if you're an expert, you lose that which is, the expertise is real, really, really poisonous to, uh, to anything that's creative. Uh, it, it immediately numbs you. Um, and so I, I try, you try to not be an expert, um, and that's my approach to it. What are you thinking about for Venice? <coughs> yeah, Venice is, uh, for me, Venice is, I mean, <coughs> 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 
I'm a dog. <laughs> Two. <laughs> it's a rare moment. <laughs> Usually he's hiding when someone's... I'm not a doctor. <laughs> I have delivered a child on the channel. <laughs> oh, <that's a> <laughs> I, I have not, thank God. Um, so, uh, you know, Venice is, a, for me, it feels like, for me, a perfect opportunity. I mean, I love trying to create transformative spaces, you know, to interact with buildings, to the idea that there's a, <coughs> a chain of location that I can, uh, that can wax and wane in terms of scale and location. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I like to make pieces in spaces where people who never see contemporary art see them and where they're discovered uh, in, you know, in spaces that we don't usually see art. But if you're going to make a piece for an audience that is, you know, really <coughs> looking, really thinking about contemporary art, there is no other international venue. So it's, for me, it's extremely exciting, you know, and um, I'm already, I've been thinking about it and I'm already making it. And it's, it's exciting. Great. Yeah. Yeah, wait. I feel energized. I don't feel, you know, I don't feel burdened in any way. So. Fabulous. Yeah. And what are, slides <coughs> that you, what are the other, other two slides? <coughs> Can I? I have a few more slides, but maybe we should open it to the audience. Yeah. yeah. Floor is yours. We can't and really see please, you. Please um, raise your hand. Looks like there's something. <coughs> there. He has it over. Yeah. Okay. Right here. Are you okay? Uh, yeah, there's a hand there. There's someone right here. Ah, oh, okay. okay. That's good. There's one there and then come back here. Can I get this down or that mic? Um, we're talking about art and we're talking uh, about... Use the microphone, please. We're talking about art and we're talking about cancer. And I'm very curious in the combination, if as a doctor who deals with cancer patients, if you feel there's a strong um, component in the arts that can be effective in a positive or a negative way with a cancer patient? Um, I, I think uh, the quick answer is yes, but it depends on the kind of art and the kind of patient. Um, I think it depends on some people, um, some people want to write, some people want to engage in the, in the visual world, um, and it can often be very, it can often be a very positive experience. Um, but the problem is that, uh, there's a kind of, um, there is a kind of dogma that says that if you're sick, you must create, um, uh, which, I, which patients find, very, you know, it's kind of a weird pressure to put on yourself. You already got so much on your plate. If on top of that, now you're expected to create something about your illness, my goodness. Um, so um, I, my usual recommendation is, you know, chicken soup before the painting, if you can, you know. The, Take care of the take care of your material needs first. If it happens to express yourself, if you happen to express yourself artistically, um, that's a wonderful thing. But I, but again, I, I, I try not to put you know one additional load on on people whose lives have been enveloped by something already. Music or art in a. Um, Palliative way of therapy. In a therapeutic sense. Yeah, palliative, yes. Therapeutic, uh, I mean, if palliative is therapeutic, I don't want to make an artificial distinction between the two. Uh, but if you, if you, you know, there is a school of thinking that, um, that, that, that engagement in the arts will somehow become translated beyond the palliative, beyond the psyche, into the physical. Um, I'm, a little, I'm a little suspicious of this kind of uh, thinking. Uh, again, partly because it it ultimately uh, tries to engage the psyche in which uh, I'm, I, I don't feel particularly comfortable with. Cancer ultimately is a genetic disease, is a disease in, of alterations of genes in cells that lead to unregulated, dysregulated cellular growth. Um, we have yet to connect the psyche to a mechanism to cause mutations or change the biology of cancer. So I'm a little uncomfortable with this idea. On the flip side, you know, does it help with healing? Does it help people who really want to be engaged in, in, in the musical world, et cetera? Absolutely, um, absolutely. But, but I, I'd also try to make sure that the psyche doesn't intervene too much 
on, on patients because it becomes, for me, a mechanism to blame a patient. You aren't getting better because your psyche isn't good enough. Um, you, you, you have cancer, and they're, they're very, this is a medieval thought which has persisted even to today. You have cancer because your psyche is malfunctioning. Um, it, is an, it can become incredibly negative. It can become incredibly blame, brain filling. So I'm very careful to discriminate between those applications of the psyche uh, and you know, the more palliative. But would you say that in terms of healing, and not so much whether it's cause or cured, but how people deal with healing, that the psyche has some role to play. Absolutely, yeah. but that yeah. doesn't mean that the psyche has some role to, you know, music mm. can seem awful to someone in that mm. process of healing. Depends uh, on what that is. Yeah, it depends on what that is. I, I have a, um, um, uh, there was a, there was a uh, as I said, I was just thinking about this. I was delivering, a, uh, there, was a, there was a wonderful couple that came to my care uh, when I was a medical student I at Mass General Hospital. Um, and she was delivering a child, and they were very, very involved in, 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 the, in, in music, and particularly loved New Age music. And the, the, the man, uh, at the wife's request, brought um, whale songs to play <laughs> while the woman was giving birth. And it all started off very nicely. The whale songs were playing in the background. There was a candle, et cetera, et cetera. And all of a sudden, you know, the birth began to happen. And I, I remember this very vividly. Um, this woman screaming to her husband, can you shut that thing off? <laughs> So, um, she, said, she said more, actually. I, I, exactly. I just, there were some other words, probably, right? Right. right. So, right. for her, it was not palliative anymore. <laughs> there's a hand here. So, there's a concept in finance called the creative destruction. That's Schumpeter, right? So, the idea that uh, the financial economic ecosystem gets to create only through a destructive process. And in interestingly enough, we find that political institutions, social institutions, will very often resist that destructive process because there's an incumbency effect, and, and as a result, you don't make progress. Now, from a micro standpoint, you both have expressed your experience with death and life, right? But from a macro experience, does an artist have to, somebody who's creative, <coughs> does somebody have to experience the destructive process on a macro level, or thrust themselves in some of the things that are going on in the world today, to be able to really be able to communicate to the audience? That is to say, do you have to go to one of the hot spots of the world where things are changing, and, and you're exper to experience creative destruction? So in order to be able to communicate more effectively, both as an artist, as a doctor. I mean, I, mean, I'm, I would start with the, you know, Emily Dickinson came up before. She seems like a good example of someone who barely left her house and wrote, you know, the most in, transcendent poetry. some of the most transcendent poetry, in, at least in this country. So I think, you know, I mean, I always say about Siddharth's book that it's, that it's a book about humanity. It's not actually, you know, it is a book about cancer, but fundamentally why it is so readable um, and so meaningful to anyone is that it's about humanity. So I think, you know, and Emily Dickens' poems are really about that, um, of course, and as I think all of us. So I don't think that that, I think that that can be central to a work of art, but it does not have to be. Yeah, the reason I mentioned it is because Primo Levi, obviously. Right. Right. Primo Levi went through one of the most, um, sure. you know, just impactful, and you admire him as a writer, so yeah. I was just wondering, since there's so much going on in the world, does that mean your next thing has to be to thrust yourself into one right. of those macro situations? Well, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a lovely uh, uh, anecdote about, um, about uh, Jean Miro, um, who was once, once a, a journalist, uh, went, I think I paraphrase all of these. I think they're probably not true by the time I've made them up in my <laughs> writing. <laughs> But, but apparently a journalist once went to Miro and said, you know, there's a triad of Spanish artists. There's Picasso, there's Dali, and then there's Miro. And Picasso is essentially lives in Paris with 15 <coughs> women. Um, you know, Dali is Dali, <laughs> even further out there. But John Miro spent all his, much of his life married to the same woman in the <laughs> same village in, uh, in, this thing in, in this place in rural Spain. And so the journalist said, well, what about you? And, and Miro famously said, the parade marches inside me. Um, and so, um, and it go, goes back to, you know, if you go to, if you go to Amherst, um, 
and you see Emily Dickinson's, if you see Emily Dickinson's desk, it is this big. And from that desk, she looked out onto a window, which is about this big, and through that, on that desk and through that window, she could see the entire cosmos. Um, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to go to the Spanish War to see, uh, to see human beings that but way. But I would say the concept of creative destruction is something both of you continue to play with. Yes. As you talk about having knowledge and unlearning it to be able to put yourself in yes. the shoes. So there is a creative destruction in the process of your Absolutely. work, whether it's you go somewhere else or not. Yes. So I think that that's yes, really the, the, the location thing. can be inside, but the destruction can be just as, <coughs> uh, just as acute. Another hand, yes. yes. Uh, well, thank you very much for the communication among you, but also as a couple, how you react. Um, my, I wanted to mention about Primo Levi, because I think it is very important. We have to remember that Primo Levi, you could say, well, he wanted to take off <coughs> his weight of things and put them in the books, but he also committed suicide. Yes. So it's a very important distinction. The other thing is that I, I'm looking at your, at the video, at the, uh, the slide, yeah. Yes, at the slide, thank you. Yeah, and uh, I'm looking at uh, how you see as, a, as a, not a painter or a scientist, but it is what you give. And when you look at this, people can see so many different things. You know, it's a little bit of the eye of a beholder. Now, I know what I know about what I see, mm. but after uh, you s do your piece, you're talking also about that, m that moment of uh, truth, mm. in which you say, that's how did I do it, right? Now, once you separate from you, and you forgot about how you do it. Tell me, how do you feel now about it? What are you looking at hmm. when you see it? So that's your question. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> I just want to make sure, right? Um, it's interesting because this this um, this slide, I think, actually has a lot to do with a, a point that we jumped off of that I didn't know you were going to talk about. But Siddharth said, you know, sometimes it's important to be just ham-fisted and to in to sort of do the most, you know, he was talking about the, you know, so the, sort of the dumbest question that can be asked about your work, and I was I brought this slide in terms of exp the idea of experimentation, and at a certain point in my work, I started realizing this idea that that uh, actually <coughs> when you brought up Arthur Danto, he made an interesting point to me. He said your work is like a model, but not like an architectural model, because an architectural model is built as a stand-in for something to be built. But it, it's, it's actually like a scientific model because it demonstrates behavior, which I thought was a very nice idea. Um, and so I actually decided with this piece to just do, to actually make a kind of, what is a kind of scientific model. And I, it was sort of, the, this, to me it was sort of the dumbest, actually quite dumb idea because it was so simple, but I decided to make this, to make something, that, the title of this is Portable <coughs> Planetarium. This idea of making a, a planetarium that I was kind of absurd because it was, not portable because it's so fragile in its makeup, and that it was modeling this this thing that is so magnificent, but in this very ham-fisted way, um, and that also like a personal planetarium. And uh, your question is interesting, particularly to this slide because um, it became a really uh, people were really attracted to this piece, and I and after I made it, I I, I was also very uh, fond of this piece. And I, I couldn't, I, I realized it actually has to do with this idea of scale shift and that when you walked in, you immediately recognized it as a planet, which to me also seemed very antithetical in my work, that you would orient yourself in relation to a planet. And it's actually an image that I think we are all familiar with through pictures and through films, that we, we all know what the Earth looks like here. But, and usually what happens when you scale shift in, famously so with uh, Charles and Ray Ames, um, uh, powers of 10, when you scale, but in any image, when you see the Earth from far away, which of course is something that we've never, none of I don't think unless there's an astronaut here, has ever done, when you, when you go towards, when you pull out from it, you actually get further and further, and there is this overwhelming fundamental realization that we are 
in time and space, tiny, meaningless specks. But in this piece, as you get closer to it, and it actually is a projector in, in, in a very s silly, mundane way, which has a light and a piece of toilet paper that go like this over a black piece of paper with holes in it, but create, create a cosmic a solar system. So the whole thing is, a po a, a so is actually a, just a projector, but or a contraption that projects. But you actually enter into it. And when you, as the closer you get to the, plant, the planet, the, the larger it becomes around you. And when you get into it, it's almost like you're in a cave or in a hut. And it's actually very welcoming. And it has this opposite ex effect that we actually, I think, actually have learned to, to uh, as we see the Earth, we actually have this uh, fundamental, whether I, I, this is what I think about this, we have this fundamental feeling of both a connection, but then a, 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 a profound sense of being meaningless. And in this piece, as you enter, you actually are the center of the earth, which, is, which never happened. So to me, this, this piece had this incredible flipping of interior, exterior, of distance and intimacy, of feeling like in this Palladian sense, you're the center of the earth, and, and you're also out, out and, and non-existent. I think there is a reason why you connected to Siddhartha. <laughs> you think so? Because this very <laughs> indic notion of a tiny speck that is totally relationally connected to cosmos, and you see yourself both in that big and a small scale at the same time relationally, and it continues to shift. So see, it's meant to be. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, I think we have just reached the time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I hope that all of you had as much fun as we did. And please join us for a reception that's in the garden court. And there are some signed books, both Siddhartha's book and also the exhibition catalog of Sarah Z's work right here at the Asian Society. So please join us and we will see you shortly. Thank you. <laughs>